home again. This is Reverend John Ferret, and welcome to Truth Nuggets number seven. And this is the second lesson in the series on the Lord's Prayer. And before we begin, I just wanted to let everybody know that I'm making some announcements here with regards to fall classes. If we are allowed to open, if the churches and locations, schools where I normally teach, uh, are allowed to open and we're able to go back to normal classes again. Uh, the hope is to teach the gospel according to Moses. That's one of the podcast series. We're at uh, lesson number 12, I think, right now on the podcast series. It goes from Genesis 1 through Genesis 4 as we begin to go through the whole Torah. And God willing, that will start again in the fall on Sundays in Shoreview. Another class will be uh, again, at Shoreview, uh, on the Hebrew background of the Lord's Prayer, the class that you're taking with me right now with regards to a podcast. But we'll be doing that live, and there will be extra things that we'll be doing with regards to that class. That'll also be in Shoreview as well. That'll be on Sunday mornings as part of a Bible study of River of Life Church for the adults there. And the third class will be The Land Between, a Bible mapping class. Oh, this is fun. And we'll be taking a look at the uh, geography of the Middle East, specifically Israel, and how that relates to Bible stories and relates to understanding of the Bible. That will probably be an Andover. God willing, that will be at uh, Legacy Christian Academy. But again, all of these, we'll see. I'll keep you guys informed, not only here in, on the podcast and on the website, but also on the calendar, on the website, there's a calendar on the right side. If you click on it, it has information as to uh, what events are coming up. And I'll make sure that that is going to be posted here real shortly. And we'll keep you informed as to uh, if these things are actually going to happen. But just to give you a preliminary announcement here, as we're entering the last two-thirds of the summer. Anyway... In the first lesson, with regards to the Lord's Prayer, as we put the prayer into its historical context, we learned why Jesus gave us this prayer. Now, it's interesting, when you actually put this prayer into its historical context, we learned something just fantastic. I just wanted to share this. This is something kind of extra. There is an ancient... Jewish Christian document called the Dadachi. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. And it's a document that was written late first century, I believe also perhaps even early second century. And this is a document about the Christian congregation, the early church in those days. And it's very interesting. You can look this up in the Dadachi. It said that the congregation of Christians, mostly Jewish, with a minority of Gentiles who had also become Christians at that time, they were to say the Lord's Prayer three times a day. Now that's awesome. And it makes sense because Jews who were not Christians and were practicing Judaism, and all the Jews who are Christian were practicing Second Temple Judaism, though the temple was destroyed by this time, and their Custom was to pray three times a day. And so now here, the Jewish Christians who are still practicing a form of Second Temple Judaism, they're adding the Lord's Prayer to their daily prayers. That's, that's just amazing. I have a link on the website to the Dadachi. You can actually read it. When you actually click on that link, you'll go to Section 8 of the Dadachi. It's pretty clear uh, as you just slide down there and see section 8. And in section 8, you'll see the suggestions by the leaders of the church, of the early church then in the late first century, to play, pray the Lord's Prayer three times a day. Remember on the website, it's www.lightamenorah.org. And remember, menorah is spelled M-E-N-O-R-A-H. And that's all one word, Light of Menorah. No spaces, etc. no caps, just Light of Menorah www.lightamenorah.org and you can find that link 
in the session description for Truth Nuggets number seven. Now, if you recall, in Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 4, from the first session, we read about a disciple of Jesus who asked him to teach him to pray. Now, a disciple, a Talmud in Hebrew, is more than a student, if you recall, much more than a committed follower. He is one who wants to be just like their rabbi. He wants to live just like their rabbi. And in this case, he wants to be like Jesus. He wants to be like his rabbi, Jesus. He wants to be a reflection of Jesus in everything that he does. In the church, we call that the imitation of Christ. That's where we get it from. It's a Jewish concept. And it flowed into the church, and that makes sense because we come out of Second Temple Judaism. Now, this whole idea of discipleship is really described excellently by Ray Vanderlyn, who was one of my first teachers when I went to Israel way back in the summer of 2000. And there's an article I linked uh, at the website in the session description for this session. And Ray Vanderland's article is called Rabbi Talmud, or Master Disciple, and he really goes into detail in terms of what it was like in Jesus' day for a young man to want to follow a rabbi, for a young man to become a Talmud, a disciple of a rabbi. So again, that link is at the website and linking that article, which will give you some more background behind that concept. So again, as we go back into the historical context of understanding the Lord's Prayer, our understanding is enriched. It's a prayer form that Jesus probably used. And it's a prayer form that he gave to his disciples, which means it's for us. And shows, and it shows our commitment to be a disciple. So for the Lord's Prayer, it now seems it takes on even added meaning to our lives. Because we want to use it to pray like Jesus. And it wasn't just a prayer. It was seemingly Jesus' prayer. We would say, Hatafila Yeshua, the prayer of Jesus. Or Hatafila Adonai, the prayer of the Lord, the Lord's Prayer. But now, he taught it to us, and now we can say it's Hatafila Talmudim, the prayer of the disciples. And so now we want it to let it be an observable part of our lives. As a true disciple, this is a big deal, just like in the Dachi. I think in the people in the Dachi, the leaders there of the early church back there in the late first century got it. They're saying, if we're going to be disciples, we want to be what our rabbi is. We want to be like him. So therefore, we will pray three times a day as we normally do, but we will start with the Lord's Prayer because we want to be like him. We're going to make it an observable aspect of our lives. Now in this session, we're going to talk about another aspect of the Lord's Prayer. And Jesus has some guidelines about prayer. This is in Matthew 6. And I'm going to start in verse 5. Matter of fact, it's Matthew 6, verses 5 through 8. When you pray, you are not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners so that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you are praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles do, for they suppose that they will be heard by their many words. So don't be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. So we have some specific guidelines as to prayer. One is solitude. In context, as we read this, 
It's as if Jesus is saying, don't show off, not like those hypocrites who love to stand and pray and show how holy they are and how wonderful they are and how righteous they are. Jesus is saying, they already have their reward. No, you want to do this privately where nobody can see you. But I think there's another aspect to it as well that Jesus is implying. And I think the Jewish disciples of his would have gotten it. When you read about Jewish prayer in Jewish literature, the rabbis teach about a concept called kavana. And you're supposed to have kavana before prayer. There's a website. The link happens to be J-E-W-F-A-Q, like Jewish Frequently, Frequently Asked Questions, J-E-W-F-A-Q.org, or better known as Judaism 101. And here, at Judaism 101, we talk about Kavana. And let's see what they have to say, what this is all about. So, quoting from the website, when you say that, when you say the same prayers day after day, you might expect that the prayers would become routine and would begin to lose meaning. While this may be true for some people, this is not the intention of Jewish prayer. As I said at the beginning of this discussion, the most important part of prayer is the introspection it provides. Accordingly, the proper frame of mind is vital to prayer. This mindset for prayer is referred to as kavana, which is generally translated as concentration or intent. The minimum level of kavana is an awareness that one is speaking to God and an intention to fulfill the obligation to pray. And in session one, I talked about the fact that the rabbis talk about the fact that it was commanded in the Torah to pray. It's not there, but again, if in session one, you'll remember uh, how they interpreted one specific verse. I think it's Deuteronomy 11 or something like 11, 13. If you do not have this minimal level of kavana, then you are not praying. You are merely reading. In addition, it is preferred that you have a mind free from other thoughts, that you know and understand what you are praying about, and that you think about the meaning of the prayer. So kavana is this intentional, purposeful mindset when you're praying, and that you're trying to get rid of all of these distractions. In the Mishnah Torah, we read comments from the great Maimonides, which was a great rabbi about the 12th century AD, and he also talks about kavana. He said it's one of the five essential elements of proper prayer. Here's the five elements that he says. Clean hands, a covered body, a clean space, and the removal of distractions. And kavana, so those are the five. Maimonides writes that if a person finds they are distracted or confused, they must first regain their composure before praying. I, I just read uh, just recently that there are some Jewish rabbis who teach that before you pray, that you're to sit down and relax and calm yourself one hour before prayer. And so this way, this will help you attain the proper attitude, the proper kavana, the proper perspective. So they're pretty serious about this idea of kavana. Now in Jesus' day, there was public prayer and there was private prayer. In the public prayer, they prayed in the synagogue, reciting specific prayers in their liturgy, also in the temple, or in prayer groups. So they actually had public prayer where they got together and prayed as a group. But also, there was private, personal prayer. I think Jesus here, talking about the Lord's Prayer, is focusing in on private, personal prayer. So I think the conclusions we're coming up with here is that don't show off. Don't show off your righteousness. In other words, have a private place to pray. Nobody has to see you. But the second thing is, eliminate distractions, eliminate inter uh, 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 interruptions, and attain this mindset of kavana. Jesus seems to imply this when he said, go into your inner room and shut the door and pray in private. Now there's a second aspect. 
The second aspect happens to be no meaningless repetition. Now, the Greek word there is bata logigo. Bata logigo. Its Strong's number is G945. Now, when we go to Thayer's lexicon, the idea of bata logigo is to stutter, to stammer, to babble, using idle words, repeating something over and over and over again without even understanding what you're saying. It just repeating it. But the key thing here is Jesus said, don't be like the Gentiles who do this. Now in Hebrew, Gentiles would be goyim. These would be implied in Jesus' day, non-Jewish pagans, Romans, Greeks. And this is the key because Jesus is saying the goyim. Now this is important. Because when we study Roman pagan religion or Greek pagan religion, they had prayers. They were very repetitive. They were mindless phrases that were said over and over again. You'll read and study that these, these mindless phrases were supposed to have some sort of spiritual power if said enough times. They were mantras. There was also babbling, memorized words. Just these memorized words, babbling. Again, related to the fact that they had some magic power to them. The concepts of ecstatic utterance. Mysterious or unintelligible, loud expression of words that didn't make any sense. This what was going on in the Roman temples and in the Greek temples. So, Jesus is talking about the fact of be careful about meaningless repetition. Now, the pagans memorize their chants. Now, we've memorized the Lord's Prayer, but we come out of this Jewish perspective. So, for instance, there is a rabbi who made a statement in the section of the Mishnah called Pirkei Avot, which is called the Wisdom of the Fathers. And Rabbi Shimon addresses this idea of repetition. He addresses this idea of, okay, you've got all of these prayers that are memorized. And indeed, the Jewish Jewish people, I'm, they had a gigantic book, a siddur, okay, of all of their prayers. Matter of fact, I'm holding one in my hand right now, and Pirkei Avot happens to be a section in the prayer book and with regards to these prayers, many of these are recited. They are read. And so Rabbi Shimon is saying, be meticulous in reading the Shema and reading your prayers. When, be meticulous. When you pray, do not make your prayer a set routine, but rather beg for compassion, supplication before the omnipresent. As it is said, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in kindness, and relentful of punishment. So this is in Pirkei Avot, chapter 2, verse 18. So it's almost as if Rabbi Shimon is teaching, before reciting a set prayer, beg for God's mercy, beg for his compassion, be aware of what you're doing. Kavana, be aware of what you're doing. It's a mental focus, it's a concentration. Think of what you're doing. So for us, it's okay to memorize a prayer. But also what we want to do is we want to hear each word as we're praying the Lord's Prayer. We want to feel each word. We want to recite it from the heart and not just mindless repetition of words that we have memorized. So what do we see Jesus emphasizing to his young disciples? He is saying, pray. Don't show off. Okay, this prayer, probably personal prayer, is between you and the Father. So you want to remove all distractions, and you want to be like your rabbi. Matthew 6.6, 6, we talk about removing those distractions by going into your inner room. But then we realize, if we take a look at Luke 5.16, 
in Mark 135 or in Luke 612, Jesus prayed in a lonely place. He was praying alone. Without distractions, without interruptions, he was attaining kavana. And so we want to be like him. We see him praying alone. He's saying the same thing to us. And so this is why I say Jesus is probably teaching about private prayer rather than public prayer. It's the whole setup when that disciple asked Jesus about the fact that Jesus could teach us to pray. Avoid praying. What else is Jesus teaching here? Avoid praying like the goyim, chants, mantras. And it's okay to recite this memorized prayer. But we have to remember we need to attain a state of kavana, focused concentration on what we're doing and on the words. Now, I think there's another idea that we can add. And the idea is related to a very interesting word in Hebrew called haga. Haga, its Strong's number is H1897. And again, we have a picture always of the conceptual meaning of haga. The picture is to moan, to growl, to murmur. It's a low moaning sound, growling sound. In Isaiah 38, 14, the word haga is used where it talks about the mourn of a dove. Not the mourn of a dove, but a haga. This moaning, this growling, the sound of a dove. So a mourning dove, when it's cooing, it's doing haga. The other one is in Isaiah 31, verse 4, where a lion growls over its prey. It's captured its prey, and it's about ready to eat. And so it's haga. It's kind of growling over its prey. Now, what's fascinating is this is translated to the word meditation. When you meditate, you're doing haga. It's a moaning and growling. So in Joshua 1:8. It talks about to meditate on God's word day and night. It haga on God's word day and night. In Psalm 77, verse 12, it talks about, I will meditate on your work, talking to God about his work. Now, I wanted to show you and read to you a scholarly view of the Jewish background of meditation because it's related to the word haga. We think meditation in the 21st century Christian church is to go into a room and turn off all the lights and light a candle and just to sit back there and be quiet and let your thoughts come to mind, and that's meditation. Where in the Jewish or the biblical way of meditating, it's completely different. So I'm reading from Dr. Marvin Wilson's uh awesome book, Our Father Abraham. And again, the author is Marvin Wilson, W-I-L-S-O-N. And he talks about the Hebrew heritage that Christians really need to understand so that indeed our faith is enriched and enhanced. So we're going to talk about meditation, but it's Haggah. The word properly means emit a sound to murmur, to mutter, or to speak in an undertone. The Hebrew parallelisms indicates that what is spoken with the mouth is the same as meditation. Now, isn't this interesting? Jewish prayer is normally said out loud. It's not silent. And so if you are saying anything out loud in prayer, it's meditation. And meditation, which is something said out loud, is prayer. These two words can almost be intermixed. Here's some insights into what meditation involves from a Jewish perspective. Haga. Meditation is the outward verbalizing out loud of one's thoughts before God, of the pouring over his teachings and works. It means to articulate in a low tone thoughts of worship, wonder, and praise. The biblical style of Haga meditation may be observed today in many Orthodox synagogues and at the Western Wall in Jerusalem. 
a Jewish will davan pray with his prayer book, the Siddur, in hand, that's what it's called, expressing his thoughts audibly. And I've been at the Western Wall, and I've seen this. I've gone there to pray at the Western Wall, and I would have certain religious Jewish men, either on my left side or the right side, and they have their prayer show on, and I can hear them quietly verbalizing their prayer, their meditation, their haga. Uh, but they're not doing it that they want me to hear it. But it was loud enough that I realized what they were doing. This verbalization enables him to pray with a greater sense of intensity and kavana, that is purpose, attentives, direction. If the din or noise about him increases so he has trouble con concentrating, and again, especially at the Western Wall, I've been there, he wraps his prayer shawl even more tightly around his head. So, Jesus and the rabbis agree. Get alone. Haga, verbalize your personal words to God. Don't just recite them. Certainly, use a set prayer. But also verbalize your thoughts. Out loud. Now, after I learned this, I personally haga the Lord's Prayer. I have a specific place that my wife actually built for me. It's called the Israel Room. I pray, and if I'm praying in the morning, the first prayer I start out with is the one that my rabbi taught me. Well, Jesus is Lord and Savior, but I like to think about him as a rabbi 2,000 years ago teaching me how to pray. So like I said, the first prayer I do is Hatafila Talmid, the prayer of the disciple, the Lord's Prayer. And the first words of that prayer is our Father. And so I, there are many times, and it, it, it this happens differently, it's based upon how the Spirit moves upon me, that I might say, our Father, and I'll stop right there because all of a sudden I will meditate. Haga. Okay, it's not meditation the way we think it. It's, it's Haga. This is the verbalization of thoughts, of concepts, of ideas that come up. And I might say this. So this is just an example. So I'm coming in the prayer and I'll say, Our Father. Now here's the Haggah. Yes, Abba. You are the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. So you are my Abba and you're the God of Israel. You're the God who created the entire universe. You are El Elyon. You are God Most High. And you have all the power and you are the king over all people all nations, and the universe. You are our Father. Now that's just a sample. My Haga. Sometimes it takes me as much as 30 minutes to 45 minutes to pray the entire Lord's Prayer because I actually will do Haga. I can't help it. The Spirit just generates those words of praise and those words of wonder and awe that I want to express to my Father. And I just stop and I just do those words that are coming from, from my spirit. And then continuing on with the rest of the prayer that I have memorized. So out loud I express my thoughts, my feelings, my praise, my wonder, my questions, my concerns, my prayer requests. I do this with Psalms, Psalm 16, Psalm 23, Psalm 91. I will pray those Psalms sometimes in the morning, and I will haga. I'll read a certain phrase, and all of a sudden, it's like the Holy Spirit comes upon me, and I, I just have these words that flow out of me in response to what I just read. It really helps because this is, this is kavana. You're really concentrating on what you're saying. You're really concentrating on the words that you're saying, and you're trying to speak from your heart. And I'm speaking out loud. So we do get some amazing insights as we study the historical context of the Lord's Prayer. And for me, the Lord's Prayer has become so much more than a prayer. I'm making a statement. I want to be a true disciple. I want to be like Yeshua in all I do, all I say. 
I want to pray as if Jesus were in the same room with me. And I verbalize my prayer out loud. Now, in the third session of this series on the Lord's Prayer, we're going to focus in on the beginning of the Lord's Prayer. We're going to focus in on two phrases. The first phrase is, Our Father. The second phrase is, Who art in heaven. We'll take a look at those two. So, for instance, Our Father who art in heaven. Is God in heaven? Is that where God dwells? So I'm going to ask you the, I asked the question of you, where does God dwell? Does he dwell in heaven? This is interesting. He created the heavens and the earth. So where did he live before he created the heavens and the earth? It couldn't be the heavens because the thing is he just created them. So did he move from the place that he lived before creation and now he lives in the heavens? But wait a minute. The heavens is the sun, the moon, the constellations, the galaxies, and so on. That's a physical place and he's spirit. Is there some verbal trick that's going on here? No. Jesus spoke Hebrew. And when we understand the Hebrew, we begin to understand what's happening in this prayer when we pray, Our Father who art in heaven. It's like the word day. We know that in Genesis 1, God created the heavens and the earth in six days. Yom. And that's the Hebrew word. And we say, yep, that's 24-hour day period. But the problem is that same word is used in Genesis 2, 4, Genesis 2, verse 4, where it said, in the day that God had created the heavens and the earth. You know, wait a minute. God created the heavens and the earth in six 24-hour day periods, and now in Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, it's saying he created the heavens and the earth in a day. Yom, the Hebrew word, does not mean only a 24-hour day. Yom can mean, well, for instance, the day of Abraham. In other words, you're talking about the days when Abraham lived, or the days of Jesus. Okay, You're not talking about one day, you're talking about a number of years. We would say 33 years in some cases. So it's the time period. It's the same thing when we get into our Father who art in heaven. This prayer was in Hebrew. It's not in Greek, and it's not in English. Very interesting. So I will see you in session three as we continue in with Hatafila Talmudim, the prayer of the disciples. Shalom.